Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here today to give you my final verdict on the Fujinon Aspherical. This has a nano GI coating. It is the XIF 8 to 16 millimeter RLMWR. And I'll give you a breakdown of what all of that means here as we take a look. So uh, first of all, um, if you haven't already, I would recommend that you take a look at my build and handling episode where I give you a close hands-on look at the lens itself, physical design, and I'll revisit a few of those um, issues that were raised as a part of that and the resulting discussion, which is part of why I release these episodes, you know, in kind of an episodic fashion. And so we can have somewhat of a collaborative process, you and I, as we take a look at this gear together. So one of the things that came out of that discussion was the discussion in reference to the f2.8 aperture on this lens. Now certainly there is an advantage for it compared to some of the other Fuji options. You know, for example, there is a 10 to 24 millimeter lens, I believe, that has an f4 maximum aperture. So it doesn't go quite as wide and it has an f4 versus f2.8 aperture, which means it lets in half as much light. Now, in that first episode, I noted the fact that this lens has a similar focal length, if you take with the crop factor in consideration, to that of the, you know, there's a number of 12 to 24 millimeter F4 lenses for full frame. And, and so uh, looking at that, including one from Sony and then over, over on Canon or Nikon, you've got Sigma that makes a 12 to 24 millimeter. And so I discussed that this lens, however, does have an advantage versus those lenses in that this is not an f4 lens. It goes to that very, very wide, wide focal length, but it is an f2.8 lens. And there was some blowback on that. So I'm going to give you a look at a very quick segment that demonstrates the point that I was trying to make in that. So let's jump in. Let's take a look at that. But my point was is that the maximum aperture of f2.8 is f2.8 no matter what kind of camera sensor you put it in front of. And I'm going to demonstrate that for you here. So first of all, we have um, basically, uh, these, these two images were shot just a few minutes apart. And um, you know, same settings, 10 seconds, f2.8. This is on a Sony a7R Mark III with the Zeiss Aloxia 25 millimeter f2.4, but stopped down to f2.8. And here we have the Fuji on a Fuji X-T3. And, uh, and so I recognize, number one, this is not an apples to apples comparison because there is variance between lenses. And don't worry, I'll, in a moment, I'll show you the same lens on both cameras. But first of all, just, you know, this, these frame basically the same, you know, basically 24 millimeter equivalent versus 25 millimeters here. So there is, I would say in this comparison, there is a slight advantage in terms of exposure for the, the Sony and Zeiss combination versus the Fuji. So if you take a look here at the histogram going back and forth, there is Sony, there is Fuji. And so there is a very, very mild shift to the left. Now, um, if we actually, let's just jump in for a second. I'll remove the distractions. Let's look at the actual, you know, image itself. As you can see, again, there is a, a, it's a very, very mild advantage in the actual image itself, but you can also see that it is, it is basically be undetectable pretty much um, if you didn't have them side by side. Now what I've got here is the exact same image, but on the, uh, the Sony's eyesight, I did the processing steps that I would to help to make stars pop. And then I did the exact same. I just copied the settings directly across. I synced them up with the Fuji image. And so looking here, you can see obviously there's a little bit more vignette on the, uh, the Zeiss Loxia side. But you can see that looking at them as a whole now, there really is not any kind of real exposure advantage. Certainly not um, if you had an F4 image on this side, it definitely would look much less bright than what this does. And so, you know, and again, I mean, looking at these side by side, yes, I understand they're two different lenses. So why don't we jump in and let's look at a comparison with the exact same lens. Now, in this case, I have the, my classic SMC Tacumar 50 millimeter F1.1, put everything on a tripod, exact same settings. Here we are on the Sony. Here we are on the Fuji. So obviously the crop factor makes the framing very, very different. But we use, use the exact same set, um, setup and settings, ISO 800 and 1 15th of a second. So looking at the two um, images, first of all, there's going to be some variance in the actual uh, histogram because of how much is in the frame. But we can see that the actual difference is really it's more about the colors than it is about the luminosity. And so, in fact, let's just take a look at this for a second. In this case, I've actually got the exact same image. I've just cropped in the Sony image to basically the same kind of uh, 
uh, framing of the um, the Fuji. And so as you can see, we now have a histogram variant, in fact, a larger histogram variant than what we did before. And that's just because of the information that's in the frame. So I just wanted you to give you some basic understanding of histogram. Now here's a further comparison because here we have that cropped version. And then here we have the, the same framing, except for I shot this on the Sony's APS-C mode. And so what we can see, once again, looking at histogram is while it is more mild, there is a uh, shift in the actual histogram, even when we're looking at a, you know, different approaches to cropping an image. And so, you know, there are some factors at play there. Now, one final comparison is that I have just played with the color temperature to more closely balance that of the Sony. And so if we look at a cropped image that's framed basically equally, and we look at these histograms, we see that there is very, very, very little difference in terms of actual exposure. And if we look at the image itself, just take a look at bright areas, take a look at darker areas here. Um, I think you can agree with me that although we have identical settings, identical lens, we have one on an APS-C or a full frame here, APS-C on this side, there is not any kind of meaningful difference in terms of the exposure value between the two lenses. Certainly not a full stop, which remember would be require twice as much light if it were a full stop difference. That's simply not the case. So as you can see, I do stand by the point that I made that this lens certainly does have an advantage even related to those lenses. And yes, you're talking about two different systems and it's not an exact comparison, but part of the reason why this lens is larger and more expensive, which is kind of germane to the point that I was making previously, um, you know, people are, that's another thing that people are complaining about. This lens is, it's bigger than what a lot of other Fuji lenses are. Um, it's more expensive. It's around $2,000 US. And so they're saying this doesn't really fit the idea of what a Fuji lens should be. What I view this as being is that Fuji already has a number of lenses, including primes and zoom lenses that are wide angle, that are smaller, less expensive, and more compact. I, I view some of these recent Fuji releases um, as being essentially Fuji kind of expanding the premium options in the lineup. What they're doing is they're fleshing out their lineup and so that they have something for everyone. As you know, Fuji is dedicated to APS-C and that's what they're sticking with. And so, no, it's not typical that we see APS-C lenses, you know, wide angle zooms that cost $2,000, but that's not necessarily relevant looking at other camera systems, APS-C lenses, because Fuji, APS-C is what they are doing. And this is a lens that fills out a need. Those that are looking for a premium wide angle, wide aperture lens, um, not even so much for doing landscape, although we're gonna see this is a great landscape lens, but this lens is really more for the wedding photography crowd, the event shooters, even photojournalists that perhaps like Fuji, like Fuji color, like Fuji handling. And so it covers all of those things. Now, one thing that is absolutely certain, and that is that compared to, you know, F4 lenses on Fuji, this lens does have an advantage. And that fast aperture helps it with autofocus. Um, LM and the description that I read out to you, um, LM refers to linear motor. And so this has got linear motors built into it that allow it to have quick, very quiet autofocus. And of course, a larger maximum aperture means that as you get into lower light situations, it's easier for a lens like this to focus because it's able to utilize that extra um, light gathering potential to focus more quickly and accurately. And I found that I've had very good, very accurate focus in all kinds of situations. And so nothing to cl complain about on that front, particularly with the X-T3. It's a great partner for that. WR in this refu refers to the fact that it is a weather resistant lens. So there is a flooring coating here on this front element. And, and so that helps to resist moisture, but it also helps with fingerprints and things like that. It makes it easier to clean. Inside the lens, there are 11 different internal seals. And so that of course helps it to be increasingly weather resistant. Furthermore, it's got a gasket at the lens mount. And beyond that, the final rear element is a fixed element, which means that there is nothing moving in and out at the rear. I find that that does help to completely seal up a rear entry point. There's no way for dust or moisture to enter the lens from the back between the combination of the gasket and then also that rear glass element. 
The R in the name refers to the fact that it has an aperture ring. And I do like Fuji's approach to aperture here where you have both a, you have a dual approach. You can either elect to use the manual aperture ring and then to uh, manually select aperture at one third stop um, detents along the way. Or you can put it into A or automatic mode and you can control it from within the camera or allow the camera to control it depending on what kind of mode you're setting up. I like that approach a lot because it kind of gives you the best of both worlds and so um, good stuff there. As noted, however, this lens is large and it is fairly heavy. It is right under five inches long, 4.78 inches or 121 and a half millimeters. It is also 1.77 pounds or 805 grams. And so, I mean, of course, that is physically larger than competitors or, you know, competitors within Fuji, I really should say. But of course, as I've already noted is the fact that Fuji's already got smaller, lighter, you know, smaller maximum aperture lenses, cheaper lenses. They've got those options covered. This is the premium one. And uh, beyond that, I mean, this is not a easy lens to engineer. And we're going to look at what Fuji has accomplished. And those that say that this lens is overpriced, I would like you to, I'd like you to point me to a lens that offers everything that this lens does for a cheaper price. Because the reality is, is that you can't get to this kind of focal length, this kind of maximum aperture with this kind of performance without having some major investment in both engineering and manufacturing cost. And so I'm not trying to say that this lens shouldn't be cheaper. The reality is, is I don't really know what the price should be. What I do know from experience is that you can't make a lens like this without making it big and expensive. Now in a secondary episode, we took a look at the image quality. And if you would like to get a serious breakdown of image quality, time doesn't permit it as a part of this, take a look at that episode. It should answer all of your questions. But to give you a few of the highlights of that, there's actually very, very little to criticize when it comes to the optical performance of this lens. Um, I did find that at the extreme, extremely wide um, focal lengths, eight to 10 millimeters, that in the extreme stream corners, I mean, we were talking about the very extreme edges that it never got completely sharp in those corners. What I also found is that in real world shots, there was almost no situation that I ever saw that I could even notice that in real world shooting. And so, yeah, you can complain about that, but you know, in real world shooting, it's really essentially a non-factor. Interestingly, I found that at those wider focal lengths, that sharpness actually peaked around F4 and uh, stopping on down did not really introduce any kind of sharpness improvements. And in fact, as you get towards smaller aperture values, F8 and beyond, diffraction starts to soften image quality up a little bit, though not in any kind of noticeable kind of way. I also noted that the lens is a little bit sharper on the wide end and a little bit softer on the narrow end. And so as you move on towards 16 millimeters, it's not quite as sharp at the same time as you get towards the narrow end of the focal length, you also have a more even sharpness profile in that the extreme corners do get sharp. And in this case, you can, um, you know, stopping on down to F5.6 does produce a little bit of improvement there. At um, eight millimeters, I found that there was after the profile and recognize the way that Fuji handles this with both JPEGs and RAW, there is some embedded profiling taking place with these native uh, Fuji non lenses. And so what comes to me, for example, in Lightroom has already had some corrections applied. And so that being said, after those corrections are applied, I saw the mildest amount of a mustache distortion pattern left. Very, very mild, but you can see that's what's being corrected and uh, at eight millimeters. And as you begin to move on through the focal range, I saw very, very little distortion after that point. What I also found is that it's mild enough even at eight millimeters after correction that even in real world shooting of interiors, I really couldn't see any kind of waviness in lines, line look straight. And so um, whatever Fuji has done between the optics and their profile, they've pretty much nailed all of the typical optical shortcomings. Um, there's basically no vignette to see. Um, their uh, chromatic aberrations, both longitudinal and lateral, are essentially perfectly controlled. I saw none of them in any of my real world test shots. I also found that when shooting coma, that uh, there was very, very little coma, which makes this a very good option if you are a Fuji shooter for shooting astro. 
um, it's a great focal length. Of course, large maximum aperture is helpful. Low coma means that it can produce some, some fantastic night sky images. I only wish that I had better shooting conditions, you know, like not minus 25 to uh, go out and shoot in them. And, you know, of course, waist deep snow doesn't help either if you want to get into a good position. Now, previously, I haven't talked to you about video. So let's take a quick look at that here today. And uh, first of all, I noted previously that this lens does utilize linear motors. And so uh, for still shooting, it's extremely quiet. For video, in actual shooting, I couldn't really hear it. But as you can see from this clip, if you're making a major focus shift, the onboard mics will pick up a little bit of scratching kind of sound as it makes those focus pulls. On that note, I didn't find that the focus pulls are quite as smooth as that of Canon with DPAF or Sony's, uh, you know, third generation A7 bodies. I find that they're a little bit smoother. In fact, you can see the difference in this clip. Um, I am actually filming at the moment on the A7R Mark III and the Zeiss Battis 40 millimeter F2. You can see when I, sh I set up kind of a similar type shot that the Battis is a little bit more confident in and you know, combined with Sony, a little bit more confident, a little more quiet in making those focus pulls and focus transitions. I find that with Fuji, it's a little bit more abrupt and sometimes there's just a little bit of a pulse when it's made a focus shift. And so it, you know, it does a pulse before it settles lock on the subject. But that seems to be a Fuji thing in general. And this lens performs as well as what I have seen with uh, any of the Fuji lenses that I've reviewed so far. Now, at the same time, um, this lens, of course, as you know, it is larger and heavier than a lot of uh, Fuji lenses. And so obviously, if you have a, a really small type gimbal, you might have an issue with it. Um, on my Moza Air, which is the primary uh, you know, gimbal that I use, obviously, as you can see, I don't have any issues with it. The combination of the X-T3 is 539 grams with a battery in it. And the lens, of course, is 805 grams. And so that's a combination of 1,344 grams, which is not significant. Now, the one thing you will find is you can't do a complete 360 degree rotation there because the lens is too long. It's got that fixed lens hood that you can't remove. And so there's a limit to how far you can go before you will start to impinge with that. But um, as you can see from some of these video clips that um, I had no issues with you know, actual performance with it on there. It works smoothly. Um, it's a great, great focal length for using gimbal type stuff. And I think that if you're someone that likes to shoot some video short films with, um, with Fuji, you're gonna like the lens because it's a great focal length and also the fact that it's completely internally zooming. It means that you can, um, you can zoom the lens uh, in or out and um, you're not going to change the balance um, because it, you know, it remains a constant. And so it's an easy lens to keep balanced and to play with the different focal lengths available to you for that. So in conclusion, I mean, this lens has a high price, it has a large size, but it's also a very high performance lens. And, uh, you know, truthfully, there's not a whole lot to complain about. I know from our discussion, and I don't disagree that I wouldn't, if I were just choosing a platform for shooting landscape, I wouldn't elect APS-C necessarily. But at the same time, I found with my landscape images that I took with this combination, it really left me without any, anything to complain about. I mean, there's tons of resolution, great, great color rendition. Um, I had enough dynamic range to make the images look the way that I wanted and anything that exceeded dynamic range, you've got options. I mean, you can shoot bracketed shots, you can use filters. And so if you are a, a Fuji shooter, don't let people condescend you. This is a great platform for landscapes. But I think more importantly, I mean, and for landscapes, really the only issue is I did mention filters. Filters are gonna require an aftermarket filter system. There is no um, native way to filter this lens because the bulbous front element fixed lens hood. Um, that certainly is a liability if you're a landscape shooter. Um, but I think that this lens is really designed more for wedding photographers. It is designed for event shooters. 
um, maybe even portrait photographers that you know want a wide angle of view. But particularly for when you need that flexibility uh, for weddings or events, this is going to be a great option for that and, and certainly produces some really fantastic images. So, I mean, frankly, I, I find very little to criticize. It's a great lens. I've enjoyed using it. It's a versatile lens and it produces beautiful images. I'm Dustin Abbott, and if you look in the description down below, you can find linkage to my full written review. Uh, you can also find a linkage there to um, you know, check out the image gallery, see more images from the lens. There's buying links if you'd like to purchase one for yourself. And of course, you can follow me on social media, including now on Instagram. Beyond that, sign up for my newsletter, become a patron, and of course, if you haven't already, please click that subscribe button right here on YouTube. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.